Book Two, Chapter Three, Sir Gareth, or the Knight of the Kitchen. Now, my lord Arthur, you may sit down to the feast, said Sir Gawain, one Pentecost, when all the knights of the round table were gathered at Camelot, but could not sit down to dinner because no adventure had befallen, nor had any one come with some strange tale or request for help. Let the feast begin, for here comes a young man in simple array, leaning upon the shoulders of two stalwart serving men, and he is a head taller than either of them. Who think you it may be? asked King Arthur, as he took his seat beside Queen Guinevere. I cannot tell, answered Gawain, yet I love him even as I look, for a fair man did I never see, nor one so likely to do honour to knighthood. A little while after this the stranger came into the hall, and when he reached King Arthur he drew himself up and cried, My God bless you, most noble king, and this your fellowship of the round table also. I come hither to ask you to grant me three gifts, and they shall not be unreasonable, for any that you might fear to grant. And the first I will ask you now, and the others a twelve month hence. Now ask what you will, and you shall have it, said King Arthur, for he also liked this tall young man with his fair hair and honest look, and trusted him on sight. I ask, sir, that I may have meat and drink at your court for this first year. Now I beg you ask for something better than that, said King Arthur. Sir, that is all I wish, answered the stranger. Well then, said the king, you shall have meat and drink enough, for I never denied that to friend or foe. But tell me, I beg you, what is your name? That, sir, I would rather not reveal until the right time. Then be it as you may, King Arthur agreed. Yet I wonder greatly who you are, for you are one of the goodliest young men I have ever seen. And after that he gave him into the charge of Sir Kay, and bade him give as good food and drink as if he had been entertaining a great duke or baron. He's neither of those, said Sir Kay contemptuously. If he were even a knight's son, he would have asked for horse and armor, not food and drink. I'll wager he's only a vulgar peasant's son, and not fit to mix with us knights. Well, I'll give him a place in the kitchen, with as much food as he can eat. In a year's time he'll be as fat as a pork hog, and since he has no name, I'll call him Beaumains. Fair hands, for I have never seen any so big or so white, or so idle and lazy. So for a whole year Beaumains served in the kitchen, and Sir Kay laughed at him, said unkind things to him, made rude jokes about him, and generally did his best to make his life as unbearable as possible. But Beaumains was always gentle and patient, never answering Sir Kay back, nor refusing to do whatever unworthy and lowly an office he commanded him. And Sir Kay, feeling that he might be in the wrong himself, jeered at him more and more unkindly. Pentecost came once more, and the whole round table was met again at Camelot. Nor would King Arthur sit down to the feast until a squire came to him and said, Sir, you may go to your meat, for here cometh a damsel with some strange adventures. And in a few minutes the damsel came into the hall, and knelt before King Arthur, begging him for help. For whom? said the king. What is the adventure? For my sister, the Lady Lyonnais, she answered who is kept a prisoner in a castle by a wicked tyrant who has destroyed all her lands, and his name is the Red Knight of the Red Lawns. At these words, Beaumains came suddenly before the king and said, My lord, I thank you for what I have been these twelve months in your kitchen, and have had my fill of meat and drink, and now I will ask for the other two gifts which you promised me, firstly that you will grant me the adventure of this damsel, and secondly, that Sir Lancelot of the Lake shall ride with me until I have proved myself worthy of knighthood at his hands, for it is my desire to be made a knight by no one but Lancelot. These things I will grant you, began King Arthur, but the damsel, whose name was Lady, Nin Lady Lynette, broke in angrily. Fie upon you, King Arthur! What an insult is this, that you send a filthy scullion out of your kitchen to save my sister, when here at your round table sit Sir Lancelot and Sir Gawain, Sir Gaheris and Sir Bors, the best knights in the world, besides many others that are brave and noble also. Then in a great rage she mounted her white palfrey and rode away from Camelot, and as Beaumains made, made ready to follow her, 
there came a dwarf carrying a great sword for him, which he hung at his side, and outside the hall a mighty war horse was waiting, on which Beaumains mounted and rode away, Lancelot following a little behind. Then in the hall Sir Kay sprang up angrily, exclaiming, I will ride after my kitchen boy and thrash him soundly for setting himself up like this. You had best abide at home, said Sir Gawain. But Sir Kay would listen to no advice. Away he went, fully armed, as fast as his horse would carry him. And before long he overtook Beaumains, who had just caught up with Lady Lynette. Hey, Beaumains, shouted Sir Kay, what are you doing out of the kitchen? Where is your reverence for your betters? Do you not know who I am? Right well I know you, answered Beaumains, turning his horse. You are Sir Kay, the rudest and most ungentile knight of the court. Therefore beware of me. This made Sir Kay so furious that at once he set his spear in rest and charged at Beaumains, who, unarmed as he was, spurred to meet him, his drawn sword in his hand. And just as Sir Kay's spear seemed about to transfix Beaumains like a moth on a pin, he swerved his horse suddenly to one side, paired, parried the spear with the back of his sword blade, and caught Sir Kay deftly on the point of it. Then Sir Kay fell off his horse and lay there with a great wound. But Beaumains took his spear and shield and rode on after Lady Lynette, while Lancelot, who was following close behind, flung Sir Kay across his horse and turned it loose to carry Kay back to Camelot as best it could. Meanwhile, Beaumains overtook Lady Lynette, but he met with no kind greeting. Fie upon you, she cried. Why have you dared to follow me? You stink of the kitchen, and your clothes are moldy with grease and tallow. As for that knight whom you have wounded or killed, you struck him a coward's blow. Turn round, I tell you, and go back to your kitchen, for well I know that you are only the dirty scullion whom Sir Kay named Beaumains because of your big hands. Bah! Your hands are only fit for plucking fowls and turning the spigot in a beer butt. Damsel, answered Beaumains politely, you may say to me what you wish, but never will I turn back, for I have promised King Arthur to undertake your adventure, and achieve it I will, or die in the attempt. You'll achieve my adventure, will you? jeered Lynette. Why, before long you will meet with such an adversary that you'll give all the broth and Camelot to be allowed to go back to your kitchen alive. That we shall see, answered Beaumains quietly, and they rode on in silence, the lady, the lady Lynette a little way in front. Before long they came to a great black hawthorn tree by the side of a dark glade, and there hung a black banner and a black shield, and by it sat a knight all clad in black armor upon a black horse. <clears throat> now flee away quickly, said Lady Lynette to Beaumains, for this is the black knight of the black lawns. I thank you for your words, answered Beaumains, but he showed no sign of doing as she advised. Damsel, cried the black knight, have you brought this fellow from the court of King Arthur to be your champion? Heaven forbid, said Lynette. This is only a scurvy scullion who follows me, whether I will it or not, and I beg you, Sir Knight, to deliver me from him, for he wearies me greatly. Why then, said the black knight, taking up his black shield and his black spear, I'll knock him off his horse and let him walk back to Camelot. It's a fine horse, and will be very useful to me. You make passing free with my horse, said Beaumains. Come now and take it if you can, and if you cannot, then stand aside and let me pass across these black lawns of yours. Say you so, cried the black knight. You speak saucily for a mere kitchen knave. You lie, shouted Beaumains. I am no scullion, but a gentleman born and of nobler ancestry than you are. At this they set their spears in rest and came together like two mad bulls. The black knight's spear glanced off Beaumain's shield and did no harm, but Beaumain's pierced the black knight through shield and armor, so that he fell out of his saddle and died. Fie on you, cowardly scullion, cried Lynette. You slew him by treachery, and with that she rode away quickly. But Beaumain's got off his horse and clothed himself in the black knight's armor, but he kept his own sword and Sir Kay's shield and spear. Now Sir Lancelot had seen all that had passed, and coming up to Beaumain's said, Sir, you have done right valiantly, and I now, and I now will make you a knight with all my heart. But your name, you must tell me first, though I will not speak it to others until you wish it. My lord, answered Beaumains, kneeling with bowed head, I am Gareth of Orkney, 
youngest son of King Lot and of Arthur's queen, Arthur's sister, Queen Morgaz. So Gawain is my brother, and Gaheris and Agravain also, but they knew me not, for none of them have seen me these last ten years. Right glad am I this day, said Lancelot, and herewith I make you a knight. Go forward as you have begun, and there will be a place waiting for you at the round table, and I hold that you will be one of the truest knights in all the realm of Logris, and one of the gentlest and most valiant. Then Lancelot returned joyfully to Camelot, but Beaumains, whom we now know, whom we must now call Sir Gareth, sprang upon the black knight's horse and rode after the Lady Lynette. Away, kitchen knave, she cried. Fah, out of the wind, for the smell of stale grease makes me sick. Alas, that a so good a knight should be murdered by such as you. But there is one hereby who will make you pay dearly. Therefore run away while there is still time. I may be beaten or slain, said Gareth gently. But flee will I never, nor leave you until this adventure be accomplished. Before long they met suddenly a knight dressed all in green armor, with green spear and green shield. "'Greetings, damsel,' said the green knight of the green lawns. "'Is that my brother, the black knight, whom you have brought with, me, with you?' "'No, alas,' said Lynette. "'It's only a wretched kitchen knave who has slain him by treachery.' "'Traitor!' cried the green knight. "'You shall die for this.' "'I defy you,' answered Saint Sir Gareth. For your brother died honorably and in fair fight. Indeed, any unfairness lay on his side, for he was in full armor while I was on, while I had only a shield. Then the two knights jousted furiously and broke their spears into little pieces. After this they fought with swords on horseback until Gareth struck the green knight to the earth and then on foot. Sir knight, cried Lynette presently, why do you take such a time to dispatch a mere kitchen knave? Alas, it is a shame to let him live so long. Then, mad with rage, the green knight struck such a blow at Sir Gareth that he cut his shield into two pieces. But Gareth dropped the broken half from his arm, took his sword in both hands, and gave the green knight such a buffet on the helm that he rolled over on the ground like a shot rabbit and lay there asking for mercy. You plead in vain, said Sir Gareth. For I will most certainly kill you unless this lady begs me for your life. That I will never do, cried Lynette. I would not be in debt to a mere scullion. Then he must die, said Gareth. Spare me, I beg you, gasped the green knight. I will forgive you for my brother's death and serve you faithfully with my fifty knights. It is of no avail unless she pleads for you, said Gareth. You are about to die. "'Do not kill him, you filthy scullion!' cried Lynette. "'Damsel,' said Gareth, bowing to her, "'your command is my pleasure always. "'At your request I will spare this noble knight, "'Sir Knight of the Green Lawns. "'I release you herewith. "'Get you to Camelot with your fifty men, "'do allegiance to King Arthur, "'and say that the knight of the kitchen sent you.' "'That evening the Green Knight entered Gareth, "'entertained Gareth and Lynette at his castle, "'and although she never ceased from railing and insulting words, Gareth received all honor from everyone else. Fie, cried the Lady Annette. It is shameful for you all to honor this man so. Truly, answered the Green Knight, it would be more shameful were I to do him any dishonor, who has proved himself a better knight than I am. Lady, said Sir Gareth, as they rode through the forest next morning, you are uncourteous so to rebuke me and mock at me, for I think that I have done you good service so far, and overcome those knights who you said would beat me. Moreover, whatever you may say, I will in no wise depart from you until my quest is accomplished. Well, said she, very soon you will indeed meet your match, for now we draw near to the castle of the Blue Knight of the Blue Lawns, and only Sir Lancelot, Sir Gawain, Sir Bors, or King Arthur himself could vanquish him, and I doubt if even these could save my sister, the Lady Leons, for the Red Knight of the Red Lawns, who holds her besieged, is the mightiest man in the world, and the secret of his strength is that it comes of the magic of Queen Morgana la Fay. The mightier mine enemies be, the greater mine honor if I conquer them, said Sir Gareth. Then they came out of the forest with a great meadow captured, into a great meadow carpeted with blue seedwell, speedwell, and therein stood many pavilions of blue silk 
and knights and ladies dressed all in blue moved amongst them. In the midst of the meadow grew a great mulberry tree on which hung many shields which had belonged to the knights whom the blue knight had slain, and from a low sweeping bough hung a huge blue shield with a blue spear struck into the ground beside it, and an iron grain ho gray horse tied to the tree trunk. Run away, you stinking scullion, ta taunted the Lady Lynette. Hereby is the blue knight and his hundred followers. Then here shall I stay and fight, said Gareth, and overthrow maybe a few of them, if they come at me in turns. I marvel greatly who you are, said Lady Lynette, ceasing suddenly from her usual tone of mockery. Surely you must come of noble and gentle blood, for never did woman rail and insult a knight as I have done you, and still you answer me courteously and depart not from my service. Lady, said Sir Gareth gravely, a knight who could not put up with hard words from a woman would be of little worth. You anger me, certainly, by your cruel sayings, but then I fight all the more fiercely against your enemies, and as for my birth I have served you as a gentleman should, if I be one or not. You shall know in time, for better service still I have to do before we part. Alas, fair Beaumain, sobbed Lynette, forgive me for all I have said against you, and fly before it really is too late. I forgive you right joyously, said Gareth, but fly I will not. Rather, fight the harder, so that I may win from you fairer words still. At this moment the great blue knight saw Gareth and sprang upon his horse, crying, You there, knight in the black armor, jump down from your horse and kiss my foot and surrender this instant, or I will kill you without mercy. Nay, rather do you come to your knees, answered Gareth, for I would need great mercifulness to spare the life of one who has slain so many good knights. Then the blue knight looked to his blue armor, closed the visor of his blue helmet, set his blue spear in rest, and came thundering down on Gar Sir Gareth, who met him in mid-career, so hard that both spears were broken, and both horses rolled over on the ground. Then the two knights drew their swords and began hacking and hewing until the sparks flew, striking such blows that sometimes they both fell groveling on the ground. And at last Sir Gareth struck off the blue knight's helmet and felled him to the ground and made as though to slay him. But the Lady Lynette begged for his life, and the blue knight yielded himself to Gareth. "'I will indeed grant you mercy,' Gareth said, "'for you are a mighty fighter, and it were a pity to slay one uh, such a one.' Ride therefore to King Arthur's court at Camelot with a hundred followers, and do homage to him, and say that the knight of the kitchen sent you. That night Sir Gareth and the Lady Lynette were entertained most hospitably by the blue knight, and next morning he rode with them for a little while to show them the way. Fair damsel, he said, whitherward are you leading this knight? Sir, she answered, we are going to the castle dangerous, where my sister, the Lady Leons, is besieged. Ah, said the blue knight, then you go against the red knight of the red lawns, which is the most perilous knight now living in the world, a man without mercy, and by evil magic he has the strength of seven men. He has laid siege to that castle for long, and well might he have taken it many times, but he did not so, for the queen Morgana le Fay made it by magic and gave him also his strength. And they hoped <clears throat> that Sir Lancelot or Sir Gawain would come on this quest, or King Arthur himself, and that the Red Knight would slay him, as I fear that he will slay you. Thus shall fall out as God wills, said Gareth, and yet perchance he wills that the Red Knight shall fall by my hand, that I may bring honour to the realm of Logris, and I will tell you now, but let it not come to the ears of any at Camelot until I desire it, that I am Gareth, brother of Gawain and Gaheris, youngest son of King of Orkney, and of Morgaz, King Arthur's sister. The blue knight left them before long, and they came through a thick wood and out on to an open plain, all red with poppies. In the midst of it a castle built of red sandstone, and about the castle many tents and pavilions of red were dwelt the, where dwelt the followers of the red knight besieging the castle. Across the plain rode Gareth and the Lady Lynette, and before they reached the encampment they came to a great red Judas tree, on which, half hidden, by the scarlet blossoms hung the decaying bodies of many goodly knights, each still in his armor with his golden spurs upon his heels. 
These are all those others who came before you to rescue my sister, the Lady Leons, said Lynette. The Red Knight of the Red Lawns overcame them one and all and put them to this shameful death without mercy or pity. Then it is time I came to blows with him, said Gareth, angered at the sight of the slaughtered men. And he took a great horn made of an elephant's tusk, which hung from a branch of the tree and raised it to his lips. Stay, cried Lady Lynette. Blow not the horn until the noon be past, for now it is still early in the morning, and it is said that the red knight's strength grows and grows until the middle of the day, and then wanes in the afternoon until at sunset he is no stronger than other men, albeit he is always the strongest of any. Ah, fie for shame, fair lady, said Gareth. I were indeed unworthy if I should wait to fight with him when his strength had gone. With that he blew such a blast on the horn that the red walls of Castle Dangerous re-echoed it, and people came running out of all the tents and pavilions, and in the castle everyone came to the windows or looked down from the walls to see who it was that thus dared to challenge the terrible red knight of the red lawns. Look, Sir Gareth, exclaimed Lynette suddenly, there is my sister, the Lady Leons, looking out of her window, and here comes the red knight himself. Then Gareth turned first towards the castle and bowed low to the lovely lady who was leaning out of the window and waving to him. And meanwhile the red knight, dressed all in red armor and riding a strawberry roan warhorse, was riding towards him. Leave off looking at that lady, she's mine, he roared, and look at me instead, for I'm the last thing you shall see before you die. So they set their spears in rest and came together with a noise like thunder, fair and square, each hit the other in the center of his shield, so mighty a stroke that the others crumbled into s others that the spears crumbled into sawdust, and the girths and the bridles on their horses broke like cotton, and the two horses fell dead at the shock, and the two knights lay still and stunned on the red lawn so long that people began to murmur, They have broken their necks. A mighty man indeed is this stranger for ere this None has ever so much as thrown the Red Knight from his saddle. But presently they staggered to their feet, drew their swords and rushed together like two fierce lions lashing at one another, until pieces of armor flew from them on every side, and the blood ran down, dyeing the lawn a darker, rustier red. Presently they rested and fought again, and at the, f and at the hour of noon the Red Knight struck Sir Gareth's sword out of his hand and flung himself upon him to slay him. But Gareth wrestled with him, and at length threw him to the ground, tore off his helmet, and seized his sword to kill him. "'Noble sir,' cried the Red Knight, "'I yield myself to your mercy, therefore spare my life, I pray you.' "'It may not be,' answered Sir Gareth, "'for right shamefully have you dealt with many good knights hanging them from the red tree, a churl's death.' "'Sir,' said the Red Knight, "'all that I have done I did for a lady's sake, for it was... She it was who made this castle by her magic, and I loved her full well. Upon a time her brothers, so she told me, were slain by knights of the round table, therefore she, therefore had she great hatred towards King Arthur and all those who followed him, and she would have none of my love, howbeit she swore to be mine when I had slain a hundred of King Arthur's knights and hung them from yonder red tree on the red lawn." Then came Lady Lynette and begged Gareth to spare his life, saying, Know now, Sir Knight, that all this was done of Queen Morgana le Fay to bring sorrow and despite upon Logris. But by your mighty deeds greater glory than ever is come to Logris. For so always shall such as you bring good out of the workings of another's evil. Therefore spare this knight whose name is Sir Ironside, for in days to come he shall sit in an honorable siege at the round table. Rise, Sir Ironside, said Gareth. Your life I give you, but ride now to the court of King Arthur, give yourself and all your followers into his service, and say that the king of the, the knight of the kitchen sent you. After this, Sir Gareth rested for ten days in Sir Ironside's pavilion, and when he was fully cured of his wound, he rode up to Castle Dangerous to meet the Lady Leons, whom he had saved. What was his surprise as he came over the drawbridge to see the door slammed shut in his face and the portcullis come rattling down in front of him while the Lady Leons leaned out of a window above the gate and cried to him, Go away, Beaumains, go away, knight of the kitchen. 
When you are a noble knight of noble birth, you shall have my love, but not before. At this, Gareth was so enraged that without a word he turned and rode away into the depths of the forest, followed only by his dwarf. But the Lady Lynette came and rebuked her sister, saying, Fie upon you thus to treat the knight who has delivered you from your dangers. He is not what he seems, but of his name and birth I may not tell you as yet. Then Lady Leons called to her brother, Sir Gringamore, and said to him, Go now and follow the knight who is called Beaumains, and when he lies asleep, steal away his dwarf and bring him here, for the dwarf will surely know his master's true name and lineage. Sister, said Sir Gringamore, all this shall be done as you wish. All day he rode, and that night he found Sir Gareth sleeping under a tree with his head upon his shield. Then he seized the dwarf who sat by the horse a little apart, and rode off with him at top speed. But the dwarf cried out, Master, master, save me! And Gareth awoke at the cry, and followed Gringamore in darkness, through wood and marsh, to the castle dangerous, though he knew not whither he had come. Gringamore was there before him, however, and the dwarf had told his tale by the time Gareth came riding into the courtyard, shouting, Traitor knight, give me back my dwarf, or by my faith as a knight I will strike off your head. Then the Lady Leons came down to him and made him welcome. Fair greeting, Sir Gareth of Orkney, she said. I am overjoyed to welcome you now into Castle Dangerous, my preserver and my love. Lady, said Sir Gareth, you spoke not such words to me a while gone, though for your sake I had fought and vanquished the Black Knight, the Green Knight, the Blue Knight, and the Red Knight. Wherefore, though right willingly, will I, will I lodge in your castle for this night, it shall be as your guest only, and not as your love. The Lady Leons was angered at this, but she still spoke to him fairly and made a great feast in his honor. But as he lay in bed that night, she sent a servant with a great sword to slay him. Gareth woke, however, as the man bent over him, and guarded the blow so that it pierced only his thigh. Then he leapt up, took his sword, and slew the murderer, smiting him into many pieces in his rage. In the morning the Lady Leons rode to Camelot, and there told King Arthur of how Sir Gareth had saved her from the Red Knight, and she asked him to hold a great tournament in Gareth's honor, and full well she knew that he was either dead or wounded with a sore wound that might not be healed. But Lynette had found Gareth as he lay groaning on his bed, and she had wept at the shame which her sister had wrought by the evil magic of Morgana le Fay. But she too had learned of the magic arts that are known in Avalon, where dwells Nimue, the Lady of the Lake, and she wrought so well that Gareth was quite cured of his wound by the day of the tournament. And then she gave him a magic ring of many colors, and to those who saw him it seemed at one minute that he was clad in yellow armor, and the next in brown, one minute in black, and the next in red, and no one might know who he was. And at the tournament he rode many courses, "'jousting in turn with the bravest knights of the round table "'and overthrowing them all. "'But with Sir Lancelot he would not joust, "'nor with Sir Gawain his brother, "'and Sir Tristram was not yet there. "'Howbeit, there was no other knight so great as Sir Gareth, "'until the latter days when Sir Galahad and Sir Percival "'came also to Camelot. "'When the tournament was ended, "'King Arthur held his feast in the great hall, "'and Sir Gareth set the ring upon Lynette's finger, "'and straight away was known by all. Then the Green Knight, the Blue Knight, and the Red Knight came with their followers to do homage to King Arthur and to tell how the Knight of the Kitchen had overcome them in fair fight, and King Arthur rejoiced in the glory which his nephew Sir Gareth had won, and set him in an honorable siege at the round table, and Gareth wedded the Lady Lynette with such joy, and they lived happily ever afterwards. But the Lady Leons departed from Camelot, sad and ashamed, and she forswore all the evil magic which she had followed for so long, and in after years Sir Gaheris, Gareth's brother, won her to be his wife.